You know, the role of public relations is often misunderstood, but it's a very important business, especially in Hollywood. And no one does it better or has been doing it quite as long as our next guest, Howard Bragman. Welcome. Wow, I think I'm old. I think I no, just got I'm old. Sorry. No, 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 no. People always say to me in LA, how long have you been doing PR? And I said, well, you remember when the La Brea Tar Pits <laughs> opened? I had the Flintstones and the Rubble show up. So, no, I've been doing it, proudly been doing it a long time. I love this profession. Yeah. Now, I saw or heard, I should say, your NPR interview where you saw self-described as a gay fat Jewish from Flint, Michigan. I mean, you come a long way, baby. Yeah, but be, growing up fat Jewish and gay is good in Flint, Michigan. It teaches you a lot of empathy. And, and most of my traditional PR time, I do a lot of other things, but mm -hmm. my traditional PR is focused on crisis now. Right. And empathy is a huge quality to have because you got to sort of relate to the underdog and, yeah. and understand and, and really uh, give a dose of humanity when you represent them. I call them also call myself Rabbi Publicist Shrink, you know, so. <laughs> well, you know, there was a piece in the New Yorker magazine a couple years ago about a Hollywood publicist saying, you know, what a crazy business this was. You have to be nanny, psychologist, and sometimes <laughs> actually a PR person. Do you ever get tired of it? I mean, the last interview I heard you give, you said you still loved this business. Well, I love what I do, but I, I love what I do. The traditional PR business can be very tough. You know, when you've been in Hollywood and you mm -hmm. uh, dealing with day-to-day -day celebrity stuff, it's why I like the crisis work and why I've expanded to reputation.com and some TV stuff. If I was just doing traditional celebrity PR, yes, I would probably put the ice pick through my ear because it's about hair and makeup and uh, wardrobe and limos and yeah. that, you know, that not so much. But uh, when there's a little heat and it's something interesting, yeah, I love mm -hmm. helping people. Mm -hmm. I, I like this business. And I, you know, as you know well, the changes make one crazy but I also welcome the changes. That's just the reality of right. what we have to do. Do you mean do. the changes of the, the, the job or the changes in how technology has impacted PR? All of the above. All of the above. Uh -huh. the, but the changes of the job are great in that uh, the PR role is so much more important now with social media. You know, it used to be we called it crisis control. Now we call it crisis management. And mm -hmm. I like to say the real job is the volcano has erupted. The lava is flowing down the side of the mountain. And can we divert it harmlessly into the ocean as opposed to taking out the village? You're right. not going to stop the eruption. Right. But how are you going to end up when this is over is the real question. Yeah. Now, you have become known as kind of a gay guru. You've got, I mean, many niches. I mean, Reputation.com. You founded a couple PR firms. You're everywhere. You're on ABC. You're on CNN. You're online. How big and how important is the quote-unquote gay client to you? It's huge to me. All right, so if we Both go financially back, and also emotionally. Financially, not as much. But the gay <laughs> community has been good to me through the years. We've mm -hmm. done uh, the, you know, the, the AIDS rides between mm -hmm. San Francisco and L.A. My original company, Bragman, I'm and Caffarelli, did those. And we're doing... Right, and I did the second one. My husband just did the one last year. Yeah, well, we're doing... You know, my company's uh -huh. been doing the PR for a few years for, for these. My husband did it a couple mm -hmm. years ago. But I worked for other people, you know, my whole mm -hmm. career. And then I moved to California in 1986 from Chicago. It was a cold November day, and I was working for a big PR firm, and they said, would you like to move to L.A.? And if anybody's been in Chicago in November <laughs> when the wind starts coming off the lake and you know yeah. February's coming, you go, hell yes, is yeah, the yeah, answer. Yeah, I'd yeah. love to move to L.A., and I moved to L.A., and I, in 89, I started my own firm. Well, my first client was a young man named Joe Steffen, and Joe Steffen was kicked out of the Naval Academy for being gay. One of the first. One of the first, and one of the first to publicize. Publicize it, we should say, yeah. And this was before Bill Clinton, you know, was running for president. And in fact, I was lucky enough to be part of the group with David Mixner, who sat down with uh, then Governor Clinton and explained to him why this was such a big issue. And he sort of took it on and made it part of his campaign and sort of bollocked it up, you know, for us and yeah, for him. Yeah, but points for trying, yeah. But points for trying. His heart was in the right place, certainly. Uh -huh. And he was one of the first presidential candidates to give us significant acknowledgement. And so that was 89. And again, my first client was pro bono. And then when, um, I think then Governor Wilson in 91. Mm -hmm. California Governor Wilson, right. Uh, vetoed. Was it AB 101? It was one of the ABs, yeah, and it got us all riled up. And we were all riled up, and we were marching in the streets, and it was National Coming Out Day. And David Smith, who's now with the Human Rights, Rights Campaign, campaign right. 
uh, called me and said, listen, I'm going to Sacramento to protest. He goes, it's a national coming out day, and I have Dick Sargent from Bewitched and Sheila Kuehl, who became a state senator, right. but was then best known for being on a TV show called The Lives and Lives of, of Toby Gillis. Of Toby Gillis. Yeah. And he said, will you take them out of the closet? So I took them out of the closet in 1991. Mm -hmm. I think it was People Magazine and Entertainment Tonight. And so that sort of ended up being a niche, and I've, you know, yeah, so, I love what I do. Okay? So being gay and Jewish from Flint actually has been very good for you. A lot of Jews in the business. Yes, no, but you know what? <laughs> I used to work for this other, for, for a big PR firm who was a great company called Burson Marstow, and I had a friend there who was gay, and this was, you know, in the 80s, and people weren't out as much, and I was out, and I had a friend there in the New York office, and I said, you know, I have this dream someday. He said, what's that? I said, I'd like my own firm, and I'd like to have mainstream clients, but I'd like to have gay clients, too, and I remember him saying, oh, that'll never happen. Well, yeah, because this was the yeah. 80s, I mean, because it wasn't just coming out, it was, boy, if you come out, that must mean that not only are you gay, you're dealing with AIDS or HIV or something. I mean, a rough time to be openly gay in the business Well, world. which is why they needed me. Uh -huh. You know, there were, uh, it's one reason I felt so strongly about coming out. And, uh, you know, people don't assume I'm gay when they mm -hmm. see me, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I guess, good and bad. It is mm -hmm. what it is. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I make it a point to tell people, oh, yeah. Right. Way gay, and yeah, yeah. Um, I thought it was important that we look at the diversity of our community mm -hmm. and embrace all sorts of people and not get lost in the stereotypes of who we are as gay men and women. Um, but I also felt that they needed me. You know, this was a time when uh, early on we did all the work for AIDS Project Los mm -hmm. Angeles, and, and we, you know, my first company uh, did PR for events that raised hundreds of millions of dollars for AIDS and other causes too, but you know, AIDS and HIV, and, and uh, which was the biggest thing we did. We did right. the PR for Commitment to Life, and we had Elton John and Barbara Streisand and Hillary Clinton. I mean, it was pretty amazing right. back then. then. You, you know, you met then Governor Clinton, you know, became president. You've met Streisand, all these famous people. Has anyone ever starstruck you and you went, wow, I'm repping that person? Um, do you know who star strike struck strikes me? Who star strikes me? We just made over about there. I go. like that. Um, I have a very dear friend. Her name is Sherry Hackett, and she's the widow of Buddy Hackett, mm -hmm. the legendary comedian. And she is, you know, she's a lady of a certain age. Yes. And she has parties, and in fact, she's having one, you know, very soon. And last year I went, she has a big summer party outdoors and she has a mansion in Beverly Hills. Mm -hmm. And I sat down with, at a table with Bob Newhart, Don Rickles, and Dick Van Dyke. Wow. And to me, I was pretty starstruck yeah, because the yeah. people who impressed me are the people who were, star, were stars when I was when, a kid. When we grew up. And you know, I look at people who are stars today and they're like, oh, you're a snot-nosed kid. You know, not all of them. There's some yeah. lovely young people. But, you know, the people who like, I go to her parties and there's Joanne Worley or, you know, uh, it was the weirdest thing happened. I walked in and Peter Marshall, who used to host Hollywood Squares, was right. there. He goes, first time I met him, he goes, you're Howard Bragman. I see you on TV all the time. And I'm thinking, I used to stay home from school, watch him, and now he's yeah, yeah. watching me. And it's this never world. Yeah, you know, it's funny you talk about the stars of that generation. Uh, in my PR business, we uh, have represented celebrities over the years, nothing like you, but I remember we represented Marsha Wallace for a while, who was Carol on the Bob Newhart Show, and she was doing a round of interviews one day, and she said, you know, the only reason anyone knows who I am, she says, back in the 1970s when we had this show, 30 million people saw my face every Saturday night because exactly. there were three networks. And it got me thinking, she's right, celebrity back then was lasting. Because now out of the ether, are, they right. are famous for 15 minutes. Well, people are on people are on a TV show you've never heard of, playing a character you've never heard of, on a network you've never heard of. Okay, right, right. I have a, a niece who's a very talented young actress. Her name is Lizzie Kaplan. Um, she was best known as Janice Ian in Mean Girls. Uh -huh. And she's on a Showtime series called Masters of Sex that starts this fall. Uh -huh. And she was on a really good show called uh, Party Down on Stars. Now, nobody even had stars, nobody even knew, and it was yeah. this great sitcom with Jane Lynch and you know Adam Scott and some really unbelievable actors, and enough people didn't get to see it. So it has changed. Mm -hmm. It used to be if you were on TV, you were famous. Right. 
It's very different now. Yeah, you know, I you have to make a sex tape. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you, and I, I don't know if maybe we've both made them and just don't want to see them, but yeah, it could make you famous. But you know, what was it? Warhol said, "In the future, everyone's going to be famous for 15 minutes." No, and then he said, "Everybody will be famous in 15, 15 minutes. minutes." And young people, very interestingly, I've looked at a lot of the research about young people. Some 25% of young people believe they will be famous in their lifetime, and what I try and disabuse them of the notion is that fame is a good thing. To me, success is a good thing, making money is a good thing, having power is a good thing, practicing your art, whether it's singing or acting, yeah. those are all good things. Fame meaning, boy, you flip somebody the bird when you're driving and they go, so and so just, you know, flip me the bird. Yeah. Or you have bad service at a restaurant and you leave a bad tip and they go, so and so's a cheap tipper. That's the price you and it pay. it lives forever because what is more important, fame or privacy? And what you're talking about in the work that you've become famous for, Crisis Communications, is preserving some realm of privacy for your clients. And How again, you young, young people have no sense of privacy. Uh -huh. They don't care. When Snowden leaks that the NSA is listening to every phone call and seeing every text, nobody complained here. There were protests all over the world, not in the U.S. Young people are like, oh my God, I put every you know everything on Facebook or tweeted or Instagram anyway. Who even cares? But, you know, to my clients, it's private, and it's been interesting to go back to the gay part and people coming out. We right. live in such a transparent world. Right. You used to go to a gay bar, and then it was your word against somebody's at the gay bar. Everybody's got a phone now. That's you're, exactly you know, right. You're out, dude. Yeah. In our next part of the show, I want to talk to you about your great PR successes, but also some of your, uh, if I could have done it different, I would have. And, of course, we want to talk about meeting Cher and Chaz. Uh, we're speaking with Howard Bragman, whom I like to call the Uber publicist of Hollywood. I'm David Perry on 10%. We'll be right back. Studies say that if you have a friend who is positive, you yourself will be much more happy and optimistic. Well, Upside aims to be that friend. Here we leave all the negativity behind us and focus on the positive stories pulsating throughout the world, the country, and especially right here in Northern California, from Fresno to Stockton, Sacramento, and back to the Bay Area. We want to be your source of encouragement, so end your day on an upbeat with Upside every Tuesday and Thursday at 6.30 right here on Comcast Hometown Network. Comcast Hometown Network is your home for Comcast Newsmakers In-Depth, bringing you the news and information you need from the people who make a difference. Local leaders talking local issues, Tuesday and Thursday at 5 p.m. on Comcast Hometown Network Channel 104. Okay, so we're going to ask the question now that a lot of my gay fans want to know. Have you met and what is she like? Share. I did. Well, I've, <laughs> I've been fortunate enough to represent Chaz for a number of years. Yeah. Um, back, back when, before he was Chaz. Yeah, yeah. Before he was Good me. work on the Dancing with the Stars thing, by the way. You know, and uh, so, yes, yeah, certainly I've met Cher, and she's been wonderfully supportive of Chaz, and we're mm -hmm. all very grateful, and showed up last year at the GLAAD Awards to present to Chaz. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when, when Chaz came to me, and Chaz and I had been friends, and I had taken people out, but I'd never done a quote-unquote transition and I'm like yeah. well this is new and a lot of people didn't know how to deal with it and I you know we had a great team Chaz's attorney and Chaz himself has wonderful instincts mm -hmm. um, growing up in that kind of family and we got amazing amazing support and uh, you know I said you know after you get done with your book and your documentary and you know all this I said I want you on Dancing with the Stars he's like Dude, you're crazy. <laughs> and I said, no. I, 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 so that I was your idea. Of, it was my idea. And he said, dude, you're crazy. That's never going to happen. And I said, it is going to happen. And in fact, you know, fans of Chaz can certainly follow him on Twitter, but we're going to see him. Um, he's lost 75 pounds. He looks amazing in mm -hmm. conjunction with the TV show The Doctors mm -hmm. and a food program called Freshology and exercise and nutrition. He's like a new guy and he's adorable. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so he's healthier, he's fit. And, you know, I said, your life is about transition and you need to make this last transition. Well, you know, I mean, I'll only speak for myself. I don't know about you, but when I came out, you know, a gazillion years ago and moved to San Francisco, I didn't know anything about the T in LGBT. How much had you learned working with Chaz about uh, the transgender community? Well, I know that I know that 
gender expression is really a continuum, just like sexual orientation, mm -hmm. okay? I met with a woman recently in New York who's the brother of a friend of mine, and she's a woman, born a woman, who goes by she, but she considers herself gender neutral. She actually had her breasts removed mm -hmm. and has dated men and dated women, but she likes to be called gender neutral neutral and she either looks like a cute skinny girl or an 18 year old boy uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> and you know I'm learning that there's all sorts of sexual expression and even people in our own community often get confused between gender identity and sexual orientation mm -hmm. and it can be a little confusing and because there are trans people who are straight trans people who are gay trans people who are bisexual trans people who are celibate you know right, right. We, we've seen every measure of this and Chaz is probably the most famous trans person in the history of the world, and for me, it's really an honor to be right. a small part of that. Nate, you know, we were joking before, you said, oh yeah, not many Jewish people in PR, you know, a lot of gay people. Have you ever come across Everybody's Jewish in PR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you ever come across it? You know, Against you? That you I thought, know they're treating that, me bad because I'm gay. Not really, but I know that there were a lot of, that there are certain celebrities who didn't want to go with me who may have been closeted and said, if I go with Howard Bragman, they'll think I'm gay, so uh -huh. I'm not going to do that. So, I, you know, and I know probably my competitors, I know for a fact that competitors used it against me, but competitors will use what they can against you. Yeah. I don't really care. Yeah, but you're the one now with ABC and CNN, so. Well, you know, I don't really yeah. care what they want to use yeah, against yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, I've tried to do what I do with integrity and honor and you know I've never sold against other companies I've always sold what we had mm -hmm. and and uh, you know yeah. don't worry about that yeah best thing you ever did and worst mistake um I don't you know I don't want to sound like George Bush here but I don't think either I, one uh, yeah I don't uh, <laughs> yeah I don't want to think I don't think I made mistakes because I think mistakes are part of learning and part mm -hmm. of life and as long as you grow as a result of that mm -hmm. I think that's the good part I mm -hmm. think that's what you try and do and I don't consider anything that happened even when I was in a pickle I don't consider them mistakes and even when, when people were upset with me uh, uh, right you know I've represented people that you know have done quote unquote bad things to our community and helped them make amends and a lot right. of people in the community have been mad at me and it's yeah. like we have the right to make mistakes and learn from our mistakes. Absolutely. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, you know, the whole San Diego hotel thing. How did you learn from that? I mean, you ended up raising was, some money for the community. It was painful. I mm -hmm. raised, I, I took a guy who was an enemy who had given 200000 against Prop 8 or yeah. for Prop 8. Yeah, yeah to give 200000 to our community, uh, to apologize, and to say I'm never going to do that again. And I, I literally lost one of my dearest friends over mm -hmm. that, and we're only now starting to make amends. Right. Um, you know, because he thought I was wrong. Uh, you know, other people attack me for that. And I believe in forgiveness. I truly believe mm -hmm. in forgiveness. And if, if you say we're not going to accept your apology, then what is the answer? The answer is screw you I'll give 400,000 next time yeah my, my mentor and one of my dear friends Anthony Turney was the head of the names project AIDS Memorial quilt for many years and he got asked famously once in an interview would you take money from a tobacco company and he said and I've always remembered it I'd take a dollar from the devil himself if it would end AIDS you know and from his point of view the use of the money is what cleansed it now what about your good stuff what's the thing that you're the proudest of besides jazz I, you know I was at the airport today flying to San Francisco and I ran into a former employee of mine who's a gay guy and a Latino guy and he now works at a big agency and he's a senior guy in their division. I'm proudest of the people. I'm proudest of the people we hired and the kind of grown-ups they've turned into. Mm -hmm. uh, they're running businesses. They're run One guy who worked for me is running PR for Tom Shoes, doing good. This guy is spreading the gospel for gay stuff and Latino stuff and mm -hmm. companies. Uh, some of the best young publicists in LA. What I'm proudest of is the people that we mentored, that we shaped, that we molded. Um, that's amazing. I mean, it's easy to say, oh, when my client won the Oscar, I did that, but that's 
you know, you as a PR guy, you're lucky enough to be there mm -hmm. the best and the worst time of people's lives. Right. But it's really when I look at the lives these people have built. I remember the first time I walked in the office and I looked at all the cars in the parking lot, and I'm like, holy crap! I'm paying the I'm paying the leases on all those cars, <laughs> you know. And it's a lot of responsibility. But uh, great young people. Yeah. Now you talk about the best of times and the worst of times. You had some of that with I know uh, a very dear friend of yours, someone who changed journalism and certainly the face of AIDS. Talk to me about Randy Schultz. When I, I met Randy, Randy was in L.A. in the um, like late 80s, and he was trying to become a Hollywood writer, which didn't work out well for him. But we used to take our, when I had just started my company, I wasn't that busy, and I'd go take my dog to the dog park, and Randy and I would just walk around and talk. And, you know, we became very, very, very dear friends. And um, I, you know, helped him, helped him, encourage him to write his book book on gays in the military mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you a funny story we were in San Francisco and Warner's at that time was uh, it was Warner's was going to do the mayor of Castro Street mm -hmm. um, so Warner Brothers in all of its wisdom said we're gonna have a town hall meeting in San Francisco to decide how to do this movie oh my dear yeah talk about this was bad idea yeah yeah hmm. And so Randy knows that once you sell your book to a studio, you let go, and the studio is going to do what they want. And I went with him as an observer. And I'll never forget, somebody raised their hand, moderator calls him, and he says, when you portray gays and lesbians, I don't want a bunch of limp-wristed queens and butch dykes. I'm tired of those stereotypes. You stop it right now. Everybody cheered. Ten minutes later, somebody raised their hand and said, don't forget the limp wristed queens and butch dykes <laughs> that couldn't stay in the closet, who were the first ones out and our initial heroes. So, you know, the people who rioted at Stonewall, everybody cheered again. And I, you know, what's greatest thing about our community is the most diverse community in the world. You go from the poorest kid in sub Saharan Africa who may be gay to, you know, David Geffen at the other end. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you run the range, every color, every religion, every country. Um, and it's amazing. And, uh, you know, we, we have a habit of eating our own, and I don't mean in a loving, fun, frolicky yeah, Friday yeah, night yeah. kind of way. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can be really harsh on each other. And I really hope we learn to love each other a little more and accept and honor our differences yeah. because... There are differences. Yeah. You don't often hear a PR person sounding like a philosopher. You can't do it as long as I've done and mm -hmm. seen people. You know, when you have represented the Lewinsky family and Naomi Campbell, when you've taken an actor who needs two days of work to keep his SAG benefits because he has AIDS, uh, when you've helped Ed McMahon keep his house, you understand that there's mm -hmm. human pain and there's hu real human suffering there. And you just try and make things a little better. You know, they call us spin doctors. Sometimes the patient's terminal, but that doesn't mean the doctor abandons the patient. It means you hold their hand, help understand what's going to happen, help them on their journey. Mm -hmm. In our last few moments, what's next for you? Well, I'm, I'm vice chairman of a company called Reputation.com, and what we really do is focus on your online reputation, which is how you're defined right now. And if you go to Reputation.com, you'll see all the great things we do, and we help people who've had problems. And I'm on TV. I'm a you know, contributor to ABC News, which is a significant honor for me, mostly Good Morning yeah. America. So the next time I get in trouble and I need my online reputation managed, you're the, you're the guy I call. I'm the dude. I'm the dude. <laughs> <laughs> We've been speaking with the dude, my friend, longtime colleague, Howard Bragman. I'm David Perry. You've been watching 10%. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next week.